If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn in the Old Testament to Psalm 111. Psalm 111. That will be our Old Testament reading, and then we will turn once more to Ephesians chapter 5. So Psalm 111, starting at verse 1. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have good understanding. His praise endures forever. Now let us turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. For those who are visiting, we have been working our way for the last number of months through the book of Ephesians. And we are now looking at Ephesians 5 verses 15 to 21, verses 15 to 21. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, Dressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. This morning, we looked at Genesis 4, and we saw there the contrasting development of what has been called the city of man on the one hand and the city of God on the other. And I mentioned this morning that the people of these two cities, what we might call the world and the church, the the elect and the reprobate, that on this earth, they are intermingled together. God's people on this earth are always dwelling as pilgrims. Side by side, living with unbelievers in an unbelieving world and in its systems of sin. As we come into the New Testament, those basic realities don't change for the people of God. We are always a pilgrim people, called to live in the world and yet not be of the world. Jesus prayed in John 17, Father, I do not ask that you take them, that is his disciples, out of the world, that you keep them from evil. As we come again to our study of Ephesians this afternoon, one of the things that the Apostle Paul has been doing is he has been highlighting this very fact. He's been dealing with the reality of how the Christian, how, how the church is to live in relation to the sinful, corrupt world around us. He's been dealing essentially with how the, the city of God is to function in the midst of the city of men. And Paul has highlighted Again and again, this very thing. Though we are in the world, we are not to be of the world. Though we are in the midst of a corrupt society, we are to be a set-apart people. Imitators of God, demonstrating the likeness of God, walking as children of light. In the previous passage, Paul talked about how as we do that, as we walk as children of light, we will become a bright shining light, a city on a hill exposing deeds of darkness by the lives that we live. 
Well, as Paul goes on from there, he really continues with this theme, this theme of what must mark the Christian in this world. And in verse 15 to 21, he adds two more commands, two more commands to how we are to live in this world while not being of it. And in essence, what he does is he highlights that if we are to be faithful, we are to be a wise and spirit-filled people. That is, we are to be a people that are governed by wisdom and to people that are controlled by the Holy Spirit. So what I want to do is I simply want to look at these commands one at a time. In verses 15 to 17, we are called to walk in wisdom. And in verses 18 to 21, we are called to be filled with the Spirit. Walk in wisdom and be filled with the Spirit. So first, Paul calls upon Christians to walk in wisdom. Walk in wisdom. Look at verses 15 to 17. He says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. In that first phrase, the Apostle Paul adds the word. He says, look carefully then. Some translations say, they translate as, therefore, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. And that word then, or therefore, shows us once again that Paul is building upon what he has just said. In essence, Paul is saying, okay, you are here as children of light, called to expose deeds of darkness in a corrupt world. Well, if that's the case, he's saying, make sure that your lifestyle is marked by true wisdom. Walk in wisdom. As Paul expands upon this call to walk in wisdom, he shows us that there are three aspects, three aspects to this call to walk in wisdom. First, walking in wisdom requires that you think about what you do. It requires that you think about what you do. And we see this in verse 15. He says, look carefully how you walk. That's to say, don't be thoughtless, but think about what you're doing. Think about the steps. Be aware of the steps that you are taking. In essence, he's calling for intentionality in your life. And of course, that's implied in the very definition of wisdom, isn't it? Wisdom is different than knowledge. Knowledge is facts. Knowledge is is information that we take in and that we gather. However, wisdom, wisdom is the practical ability to apply the knowledge that we have in the best way. It's the ability to apply knowledge to our lives in the fear of the Lord. And of course, this is not natural to anyone, is it? A writer of Proverbs, Proverbs tells us that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. We're not born with wisdom. We are born with foolishness bound up in our hearts. And so our natural bent is towards being unwise. And the unwise person, you can see this reflected in the book of Proverbs. The unwise person is the person who does not think about what they're doing. They just act upon impulse. They just go with the flow. They take the path of least resistance without considering what the consequences might be. And Paul is saying, don't be that way. But instead, give thought to what you're doing. Be intentional in how you live. Because that's part and parcel to what wisdom is. And so the first aspect then of walking in wisdom is to recognize that we need to be intentional. We need to think about what we do and say in light of our calling as Christians. Look carefully, Christian, how you walk. The second aspect Uh, to walk in wisdom that is really building upon that is that you count time as precious you count time as precious look at verse 16 it says look carefully how you walk not as unwise but as wise making the best use of the time because the days are evil you know again this is building upon verse 15 be careful how you walk and being careful how you walk being intentional implies you're going to make the best use of the time and the opportunities that are before you. And again, we can see this reflected in the book of Proverbs. The wise are often contrasted to the slothful, to the idle, and to the lazy. So part of being wise is being diligent and being hardworking. Now, it's interesting, the phrase that is used here could be translated as redeem the time. The older translations use that. You're probably familiar with it. I think that's the King James. Redeem the time. 
It's interesting that the word that is used here is the same word that is used from time to time in the context of Christ redeeming his people. And it literally means purchase, to purchase, to, to buy back. And so in Galatians 3, we are told that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. That is to say, he ransomed us. He, he bought us back from under the curse by paying its price for us. And so we could say here, redeem the time, buy up, purchase the time. It's a picture of a merchant who is taking every opportunity to buy a, a precious commodity whenever he finds it in the market. And of course, what it implies is that we have a price to pay. We are to make the best use of the time. If we are to redeem the time, there is a price that we must pay. And of course, that price is the price of self-discipline and of self-denial that buys time away from idleness and vanity. You see, time is constantly slipping away, isn't it? Even as we sit here and speak, the, the second clock is ticking. Time is slipping away. And if we're not careful, if we're not intentional, Time is going to be wasted on that which is vain and useless and fleeting. It's all going to be spent on a world that is passing away and will soon be gone, as we saw with the line of Cain this morning. And so Paul says we have to be intentional to buy it up, as it were, while it's on the market. And the reason for this urgency, Paul says, is because the days are evil. We're not living in paradise we're not living in days of peace and security. We are soldiers behind enemy lines. Just imagine a, a group of soldiers and they're parachuted in behind enemy lines. They have a mission to do. And yet as they land, one of them banged their, their knee on their way down. The other one took a little bit of a hard fall as he landed. And they decide, well, let's take our parachutes, make some hammocks, and spend a few days here taking it easy and recovering. It's a foolish picture. It's an absurd picture. Of course they wouldn't do that. They recognize they're in hostile territory. They're behind enemy lines. So Paul says the days are evil. The powers of darkness are not wasting time. They're all around us. They're advancing constantly. The powers of darkness are taking every opportunity to spread their corruption, to spread their deception. There is pressure that is around us. It is always forcing us downstream because there's sin in our own hearts. It pushes us toward the waterfall, as it were. You've probably heard the phrase that idle, idle hands are the devil's workshop. Because while David was idle in his palace, wandering around when he should have been fighting the battles of the Lord, that he was tempted and led astray in his sin with Bathsheba. So Paul is saying, make the best use of the time. Be diligent with the time you have. Make the best use of it because you can't get it back. Jesus said, we must work while we have the light. Because the darkness is coming, the night is coming when no man can work. And brothers and sisters, I think we all recognize the fact that we live in a day and an age, maybe more than any other, is filled with distraction. The opportunities and the pressures to waste time have never been greater. And as Christians, we need to recognize the fact that we are but stewards of time that God has given, for, given to us. It doesn't belong to us to use as we choose. It's interesting, the Apostle Peter, in the very context of speaking about redemption, he says that we were ransomed. And this time he doesn't say from sin. Other places, clearly, we're ransomed from sin. We're ransomed from the curse of the law. But the Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 1 that the Christian was ransomed from the futile ways inherited from our forefathers by the precious blood of Christ. We were bought back from a life of futility, from a life of vanity. And so all that we have and all that we are has been purchased by God. We are not our own. We've been bought with a price. And that includes the minutes and the hours, the days and the years that God has given to us. And so since Christ has bought us for himself, we now have a calling to redeem the time for him. Now, just as a side, that is not to say that we can never rest. It is not to say that there isn't a time when we can take it easy. God gives his beloved sleep, the psalmist says. 
But it does say that what we need to recognize is that there is kingdom work to be done all around. And if we're not careful, we will find ourselves frittering away our time on that which has no eternal value. And so walking in wisdom requires that we count time as precious. There's a third thing that needs to be added to these considerations. There's a third aspect to walking in wisdom. And that is that walking in wisdom requires that you understand the will of God. Look at verse 17. He says, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, again, Paul is building on the last verse. What he's doing is he's being very careful that he doesn't give the impression that wisdom simply means that we cram our schedules full of activity. Eternity is coming. We better get to work. And so we fill up our schedules, cram them full, serving, 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 serving. Because you see, it's possible to be very, very productive, and yet to find ourselves running in the wrong direction. We might not be lazy or idle, but if we're not careful to understand God's will, we might find ourselves spending our energy and our diligence on the wrong things. We need to be careful that we're not found having a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. If you think of going on a trip, I assume this has probably happened to some of you. You're going on a trip and you find that you're running late, so all of a sudden you're in a hurry. And in that moment, you realize time is precious. We need to get moving. But in your hurry, you fail to carefully consult the directions. And after driving for an hour or so, you suddenly realize you don't don't actually know where you are. You took a wrong turn at some point. Or even worse, you found that you went in the complete wrong direction from the get-go. I know a farmer. He lives in Iona Station. It's close to St. Thomas. His, His farm is just a little bit off the 401. And he told me a story once of a a family in a car that stopped by his farm and he was working and they were asking for directions. They said that they were, they were going to a wedding in Kingston and they were wondering if he could point them in the right direction. And, and my friend was like, well, my friends, you're going to miss the wedding. So you might as well just come in for dinner. So I think they stopped for dinner. They've gone two hours in completely the wrong direction. And Paul is saying, don't do that in your Christian life. Yes, make the best use of the time. Yes, be diligent. But before you take off running, consult the map. Search the Bible. Understand the will of the Lord, Christian. Because there are fools who waste time through through sloth and through laziness. There are also fools who waste time through mindless activity and misguided zeal. So Paul says, don't be foolish, but understand God's will. So with those three things, then, we have a picture of what it means to walk in wisdom before the world. It brings together intentionality and diligence and understanding, and it stands in contrast from living in a way that is thoughtless and idle and undiscerning. So again, we need to set this call, as we've been seeking to do with all of these commands, we need to set it for a moment in the context of Ephesians. So up to this point in the epistle, Paul has several times given us a very dark picture of lost humanity. Lost humanity is walking in slavery and corruption and ignorance. But in the midst of this dark and hopeless situation, the grace of God has entered in. The gospel has come. and God has bought a people. He's made them alive by his grace. And the awesome weight of the purpose of the Christian has been set before us time and again, hasn't it? We are created to be a people who magnify the glorious grace of God. There are to be trophies of God's grace in this world. There are good works that were planned before the ages that we, we should walk in as individual Christians. Paul said about the church, he said that our calling as the corporate body is to show forth the manifold wisdom of God to the angels. And he said that together we are to grow up into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. These are These are callings, these are statements of massive proportions. And in this very chapter, Paul has said that we are walking in wisdom, but we are surrounded by a people living in shameful works of darkness who are bringing the wrath of God upon themselves. This is the context in which we live. When we think about the sheer scope and the depth and the breadth of those realities and the glory of our calling. It's little wonder, is it, that Paul calls us to walk in wisdom. 
It's little wonder that Paul would call us to be mindful and diligent and understanding in how we live. Brothers and sisters, we need to be careful, not just about sins of commission, not just doing things that we shouldn't do, but we need to be careful and be mindful about wasted time and wasted opportunities. Beware, Christian, of endless social media scrolling. Beware of getting sucked into spending hours in front of the television or in front of video games. Beware of just lazing around with no purpose day after day. And young people, I would encourage you, learn to walk in the way of wisdom. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, remember your creator in the days of your youth. It's okay to have fun with friends, but be careful about constantly wasting time on nothing. Make sure now that your soul is right with God and then build up the strength of your soul while you're young. Learn what it is. Learn what it is, young people, to spend time in prayer with God. Learn to meditate upon the scriptures. Learn to self, to deny yourself and to serve others. When you gather together as friends, talk about the word of God. Pray together. Serve the church together. We must make the best use of the time. We are standing, brothers and sisters, on the very cliff edge of time. And before us, there is an endless chasm of eternity. Things are passing away. We are living in evil days and we are pilgrims passing through a world full of moral and spiritual poison. So because we live in such a world, because the days are evil, Paul says, let us be intentional, diligent, discerning Christians. Walk in wisdom. Walk in wisdom. Well, that is the first thing that Paul says must govern the Christian's conduct in this world. But as we've seen again and again with these commands, we are faced with commands here that if we look at it and we look at the powers of our own self-effort, we recognize that we sin, that we fall short. We recognize actually that we're very, very weak when it comes to obeying the call of God when we look to ourselves. And so it is a truly a blessing that Paul goes on to give us a second command that has built within it a great encouragement. And so he goes on in verse 18 to 21 to give us the command to be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Look at verse 18 to 21. He says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, seeking and making melody to the Lord in your heart giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So as Paul has done repeatedly in these last few chapters, he again begins with a negative command. Do not get drunk with wine. Now in Ephesus at the time that Paul was writing, probably very, true, very similar to what is true in our world today, uh, excessive drinking and drunkenness and drinking parties would have been the common fare of ordinary life for many people. And it's very likely that some of those in this church, actually, before they were converted, had lived in this kind of lifestyle. And Paul is saying, don't do that anymore, but instead be filled with the Spirit. The contrast here is quite powerful. People often get drunk in order to get some kind of high or to escape reality. Or they get drunk because it lessens their inhibitions. It makes them feel like they're freer to express themselves. But when people get to the point of intoxication, what happens is that they lose self-control. And so we talk about people being under the influence. They can't drive straight because they're under the influence. And we understand that a person who has too much, has had too much to drink, is being affected by something that in a way, is making them lose control over themselves. And when this leads to the loss of their ability to control themselves, what often happens is that it also lessens their ability to restrain their fleshly passions and desires. And so their sense of shame and sin is lessened, and they throw off modesty, they throw off decency in their behavior. It's what Paul would call debauchery. A loss of control that leads to reckless and indecent behavior. 
Paul is saying the Christian cannot behave that way. Instead of coming under the influence of alcohol, we are to be under the governing influence of the Holy Spirit. Instead of doing that, which makes us lose control of ourselves, we are to bear the fruit of the Spirit, which is self-control. Instead of seeking greater expression to our fleshly lusts, we are always to be marked instead by the deep spiritual joy that comes from the gospel. Now, there are several in interesting things to note about the command as Paul goes on to the positive command to be filled with the Spirit. First interesting thing to note is that the command is in the present continuous tense. That is to say, it could be translated, go on being filled with the Spirit. That is to say, Paul is not talking here about a one-time experience, but about an ongoing reality. Be continuously filled with the Spirit. The scripture teaches us that when we are converted, when a, when a Christian is converted, we're baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit indwells us and he makes us new and he joins us to Christ and he joins us to the body of Christ. We also read in the book of Acts that there may be times in service, in gospel service, times when the Holy Spirit comes upon a person at a specific time for a specific purpose. And so in Acts, we read of of people who in, in the moment of preaching, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, or they were filled with the Holy Spirit and did a miracle. Specific times where the Spirit comes upon a person for a specific reason. What Paul is talking about here is something different. He's talking about the ongoing reality of the Holy Spirit's work in the life of the Christian. It's the calling to live in the Spirit day by day, allowing yourself to be controlled guided and governed by him. So it's a continuous command. However, the second interesting thing to note about the command is that it's given in the passive voice. That is to say, it is a command of something that happens to us, not so much something that we do. And you might ask, well, how does that work? How can you have a passive command? I want you to think about a young child and their mom is trying to wash their faith face or they're trying she's trying to spoon feed them their vegetables and the kid is fighting it pushing away his mother's hand and his dad looks at him in the eye and says son let your mom wash your wash your face or let your mom feed you it's a command very very clearly a command but it's in the passive that's a, in essence the impression that we get here let the holy spirit fill you the impression that we have, and I think this is so beautiful and so encouraging, the impression that we're given is that the Holy Spirit in the Christian is constantly working to fill us with himself. That is to say, the Holy Spirit takes the initiative. He's not just sitting around waiting for us to come to him and lay hold of him, but he is working. He is striving to make us holy. And what we are called to do is we are called to allow him to do so. To yield the members of our bodies to his influence. To let his, his truth govern our mind. To let our affections be inflamed with the glory of God. To let our wills be directed in the truth of his commands. And so the day-to-day -day duty is not for us so much to seek after new experiences with the Holy Spirit. As it is for us to yield ourselves to him to as paul says elsewhere keep in step with the spirit to avoid anything that would grieve or quench him now what does this look like practically I and mean, that's easy to say okay keep in step with the spirit let him fill you but what does this look like practically well it's very very connected with the idea of being controlled by the word of god see a reformation principle that we always need to remember very important is that the Word and the Spirit always go together. And so in Colossians 3, this is actually sheds a lot of light on this. There's a passage that very, very closely parallels this one. But instead of saying, be filled with the Spirit, Paul says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. They're parallel phrases. Being filled with the Spirit is the same, or at least very, very connected with letting the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. And so the way that we obey this command to be filled with the Spirit is to be constantly responding to the Word of God. 
seeking its truth, meditating upon it, allowing it to dwell in us and allowing it to govern, govern us. Surrendering, surrendering ourselves to its commands, letting it search us and try us and direct us. If you want to know a description of a spirit-filled man, read Psalm 119. That is a man filled with the spirit because that is a man governed with love for the word of God. Paul goes on from verse 18 after he calls us to be filled with the Spirit. He goes on to give us a description of what the Spirit-filled life looks like. And he highlights three characteristics, three things that will mark the person who is filled with the Holy Spirit. In verse 19, he shows us that it's a life marked by praise. In verse 20, that it's marked by thanksgiving. In verse 21, that it's marked by humility. And so first in verse 19, he shows us that it's a life marked by praise. He says, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to God. So the spirit-filled life is a life of praise. Paul, Paul highlights specifically the reality of corporate praise, corporate worship, by which we sing to one another, we address one another in praise. And he emphasized that it must be from the heart to the Lord. So the mark of a person who is full of the Spirit is that they are full of heartfelt praise. A spirit-filled person delights to be gathered with fellow believers for worship. Because here we can express to one another the song that is in our heart, the praise that is in our heart. Psalm 34 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. Oh, come, let us magnify the Lord. Let us exalt his name together. That's a spirit-filled person. His praise is always there in my heart, and now he's calling to one another. Let us praise the Lord together. Brothers and sisters, we should sing more together. You know that when we first came here to, Wood, uh, to Windsor, Allison and I talked about how, I, how wonderful it would be to cultivate an atmosphere of praise, where when we're gathered together as families, we're, we're very quick to just pull out a hymn book and sing together. I confess I've probably not led in that as well as I probably should have. But that's something to build into the atmosphere of the church. Praise. This is what the Spirit works through. This is how he fills us. This is how he expresses that he is filling us. We must be a people marked by praise. Paul goes on to show also that the Spirit-filled life is one that will be marked by thanksgiving. It says in verse 20, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a very strong, emphatic statement. Always and for everything. That means when things are going well, we don't forget the Lord, but we're constantly mindful that everything we have comes from Him. And it means that when things are hard, when we are going through times of trial and pain, times of frustration, we don't lose sight of the glorious grace of God. Even in the pain, even through the tears, in the life of the spirit-filled Christian, there will be this deep undercurrent of gratitude to God. Because we know that we deserve far worse. We know that Christ is with us in the trial because we know that this too will work together for our good. Paul says in Romans 5 that having been justified, made right with God by faith, we rejoice in our trials because the Holy Spirit has shed abroad the love of Christ within our hearts. We've probably all met people like this, haven't we? People who you look at their life, maybe an, a dear older saint, and you look at their life and they've gone through incredible hardships. They've gone through incredible times of suffering. And yet what marks them? That they're always giving thanks to God. They have this calm assurance of gratitude. Because they've experienced, not, they don't only really know theoretically, but they've experienced that God is bigger than their sufferings. Actually, the Apostle Paul, as he wrote these words, was in prison. He thanks always and for everything. Paul says the spirit-filled life will be one in which complaining has been replaced by this abiding thankfulness for God's goodness and God's blessing. Then finally, Paul shows us that the spirit-filled life will also be marked by humility. 
Look at verse 21. It says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, what does this mean? And Paul is going to go on to talk about submission in the context of the authority structures that God has put in place. But what does it mean for Christians to submit to one another on an ongoing basis? I think the basic impression is that we voluntarily place ourselves in the lowest place. In Romans 12, Paul calls Christians to outdo one another in showing honor. He says in Philippians 2, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others as more important than yourselves. Jesus said if we want to be great in the kingdom, we must become the servant of all. That's the attitude that Paul is calling for, the, the attitude of a servant that washes the feet willingly and voluntarily of those around them. So brothers and sisters, these are the marks of someone who is filled with the Spirit. It's not so much that they're filled with power. It's not so much that they have big experiences. But it's that they have a deepening insight into the glorious grace of God. And it is working in them a life of praise, of gratitude, and of humility. So this is the evidence then that we are going on being filled with the Spirit. I think we could even say that to the measure that we are filled with the Spirit, we will be marked by these things. Delighting in corporate worship. Day by day filled with a song of praise. Having this constant attitude of thankfulness. Displaying the meekness and servant-heartedness of Christ. That is the measure in which we are filled with the Spirit. And as you think about that, as you're probably convicted by that as I am, just remember the Spirit himself is working to fill you. This is, this is a progressive work as we keep in step with the Spirit, as we are transformed. But remember, the Spirit is working to fill you, to fill you with these qualities, to change you into the likeness of Christ. And at conversion, he does fill young converts. And so often we see young converts, and they're marked by these very things, aren't they? Praise and thankfulness and humility. And yet as we go on in the Christian life, the flesh can reassert itself, and we can find ourselves drifting away from a consistent devotional life. We can find ourselves giving too much of our heart and our time to worldly pursuits. And we can lower our standards and compromise our conscience with our entertainment and with the things that we do. And little by little, that, that spirit filling can begin to, to go down. His absolute control over our life can, can decrease. So brothers and sisters, keep in step with the spirit. He's working. He's working to fill you. So let his word saturate your life. Yield yourself to his control. When you fail and fall short, confess your sin. Walk in the light with a tender conscience. And the spirit of God will come. And he will fill you and he will control you. And more and more as we are controlled by the Holy Spirit, we will find ourselves manifesting these glorious fruits. Not only these, but all the fruits of the spirit. We'll take on that glorious character that shines as a light in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Well, as we think about the Christian's walk in the world, then we have these two more specific commands about what must be controlling influences on our lives. Our conduct must be governed by biblical wisdom and our hearts must be controlled by the Holy Spirit. May God give us grace to walk diligently and humbly and faithfully before him so that those around us would see more and more something of the likeness of Jesus in our lives. As we will sing in just a moment, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fill with your spirit till all shall see Christ only always living in me. Amen. Let us pray. Our glorious God in heaven, Lord, we come before you and we do humble ourselves in the recognition once more as so often we recognize and we're confronted by your law and your commands. That we fall short of what we ought to be. But, oh God, we thank you that you have taken the initiative in our salvation. We thank you that you have made us alive in Christ. We thank you that you have laid hold of the Christian, that you have promised to complete the good work that you have begun. 
And so, God, once more, we yield our members to you and we pray that we might be slaves of righteousness. Take our lives, take our hearts, take our loves, take our time, take our moments, take our days. May they be filled with ceaseless praise. Oh, God, we give ourselves to you. Work that change in us that we might bring glory to your name. We thank you for the gospel and the grace in which we stand. As we go into this week, O oh Lord, we pray that you would help us to walk in that grace, to know its comfort, and also to know its prodding, its renewing power in our lives. 